This episode is brought to you by Fully Gemstones. That link, that sort of really powerful knowledge that in the ninth century, that bead managed to make it all the way from Gujarat to deepest, darkest Derbyshire is just uh, such an interesting uh, idea. So I got very obsessed with thinking about that and thinking, you know, who, who did it belong to for, for one thing? But also, how did it happen? Uh, why could it do that? You know, why were those networks open? at that point in time we tend to think that well I think it's quite easy to think that back in the past going back more than a thousand years people must have lived quite locally and not had these big global connections but I think that bee just just told me something very different. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm Carol Walton, the voice of jewellery, an author, broadcaster and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and British Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas, and forgotten histories. So please join me as I tell sparkly tales, meeting all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. I'm so happy to be here to talk to my guest, Dr. Kat Jarman, who's a bioarchaeologist specializing in the Viking Age. We are going to talk about her book, River Kings, and also the power of small objects, in particular, a carnelian bead, and how much they can tell us about cultural customs, gift giving, symbolism, and inform us about wider trends and cultural phenomena. Kat, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here and and thank you so much for inviting me. And where are you at the moment, can I ask? Because you're usually on some dig somewhere, aren't you? In some some (laughs) far away place. Yes, normally in a muddy field or something like that. But no, I'm at home in Wiltshire now, so in the southwest. Okay, so quite gentle, quite gentle for you at the moment. Yes. Um, And we're particularly thrilled to have you here on If Jewels Could Talk, because your book really is is the sort of premise of the podcast. It is really about how jewels can help sort of unravel histories, cultural phenomena, how people lived. And and this really is the, the core of the book. Yeah, it is a bit. And, and I think that's one thing that I was so excited about writing, actually. I wanted to take people away from this idea about the Vikings. I, I, one early publisher I spoke to said, well, people either like the Vikings or they don't. And I said, well, well, actually, there's much more to it than that. And you can tell these stories. It doesn't have to be just about the Vikings, but actually about some of these very human things like a piece of jewellery, like a, like a gemstone that, that links into trade and, and things like why people have them. There's so many big stories there that, that are sort of beyond just one, one sort of place in time, I suppose. Because you effectively trace this carnelian bead from Derbyshire in the Midlands in England all the way to Gujarat in India. And it's a very, very compelling, action-packed thriller, really, of, of, of how you do that. But I wanted to start by asking you about what you do and your career path, because there's a part in the book where you describe as a student in Norway when you begin sampling the remains of 40 Viking Age skeletons. And I quote from you in the book, I ventured down the metal stairs to find the skull of 7,000 people their anonymous faces staring out from behind glass-fronted timber cabinets. That day I spent just walking up and down the rows of cabinets containing shelf upon shelf of skulls. Some people, that would freak them out. And, I mean, and you described this as the golden ticket. So what was it that started you on this career path? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I have to say, I've, I've sort of asked myself that quite a lot of times as well. It, was a, it wasn't a very linear path. Uh, it sort of happened in, in lots of different ways. And I sort of kind of stumbled upon this direction. But, but then it sort of seemed like it was, I was going to end up there all along. I was very interested in archaeology and in history when I was a child. But I didn't actually realise it was something I could do as a career. I remember going, uh, so I grew up in Oslo in Norway. 
And I remember going to museums, to the Viking Ship Museum, where I've since ended up working, actually, um, as a nine-year-old girl, looking up at these tremendous ships that are just the most beautiful things, but they're real, they're, they're, you know, they're historical ships that date back to, to the ninth century. And just thinking of that link, the fact that I could reach out and, and touch it, and that would directly link me to somebody who lived more than a thousand years ago, that was something which just really stuck by me. But I, I, I didn't realise it was something I could do for a job. So I went down sort of more, much more traditional routes. I, I started studying architecture, I realised I was going to be an absolutely awful architect. <laughs> and, uh, but I actually saw a, a documentary uh, on TV, I think it was Time Team or something like that, learning about archaeology and realising that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to lo learn about these people of the past and actually get close to them. So I ended up studying it. Um, the the bioarchaeology that I do, so the, the forensic archaeology looking at human remains, the thing that led me into that basement, that was also a bit of a coincidence. We we, we were taught a bit of, of human remains, so osteology at uh, um, under, during my undergraduate degree, but um, and, and it really fascinated me. But I wasn't really a scientist. I hadn't done that much science, uh, but I was very interested. And I learned about all these methods, all these new things that we can do now, get from the, the sort of the remains. And um, one of my old lectures uh, said when I said, well, I'm not a scientist, I haven't done chemistry. And he said, well, do you know how to cook? And I said, yeah, oh, yeah, and I'm quite into cooking. I'm good at that. And he said, well, chemistry is basically cooking. And so what we do with these skeletons is, is basically like cooking. So you literally have to follow a recipe and you follow these procedures. And that just sort of kind of accidentally led me into to working on human remains and looking at these methods to find out what people ate, where they came from, everything that we can unravel. Um, and to me, that really just brings me so close to those lives. Otherwise, history books will tell you about the rulers and the battles and, and those things. But to me, the past and history and archaeology, it's all about those people and, and what they did. So that was really what led me down to that basement. It was a little bit terrifying, I, I should say, going down, but it was mainly exciting. And I think when you talk about your work as a bioarchaeologist, I think that was one of the things that struck me about this book, when you talk about your forensic techniques, was how much teeth give away and how much you can discover about a person. And as you say, you then look at these skeletons, I guess each one is an individual, they're not a pile of bones. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is what is so staggering. And, and when I started learning about it, that's when I realised I had to go down that road because it was it was so exciting. We really are like living diaries of our lives. I mean, everyone will be familiar with things like DNA. You know that that's going to come from your parents and from your, your, your ancestry and you can take a DNA test and it'll tell you something about your sort of past history. But actually your everyday life and actions actually leave signatures and traces in your entire body. So your hair is growing all the time that's being made from the food that you eat and the water that you drink. And those diets are different. So if you're a vegetarian, you will have a chemical signature in your hair, on your nails and your skin that's different from a, a meat eater. And the same is the case for geographical regions as well. So if you drink all your water, if you drink tap water from southwest England like I do, then that's going to be different from tap water in London or in Norway or, you know, the US or whatever. So there's all these very subtle uh, chemical signatures that make their way into our bodies. And that's great, but obviously uh, hair and skin doesn't last in the archaeological records. We just have those skulls in those cabinets. But teeth are formed during childhood. And everything that you eat and drink during your childhood is essentially leaving their signatures in those teeth. And the teeth remain the same. They last for thousands of years. So I, as an archaeologist, can go in and find a tooth from a human skeleton and take samples of it uh, and look at that and, and sort of pick apart those chemical signals. And they'll tell me something about the sort of climate somebody grew up in. It'll tell me about their geography in terms of soils. And that's different in different geographical regions. I can say something about diet. And so diets, you know, that's, that's to do with personal choices or it could do, be to do with status. Um, you know, poverty will, will lead you to have a different diet from a sort of very wealthy uh, person. So all those things are, are locked into our, our bodies, and, um, and and by sort of analysing that from from historical skeletons, we can we can pick apart that history. And I think there are a lot of frustrated archaeologists out there who go out at weekends with metal detectors and and discover things. And I think 
actually, they play quite an important role in your story, don't they? Yeah, so the metal detectors, that's an interesting one. So it's not really the archaeologists, that's the, these are the hobby, the amateurs, the people who are not archaeologists who do this. It's a, it's a, very, it's a great hobby uh, for people to go and metal detect. Uh, some of that is really good. But the problem is that very often things are being found that, uh, that are then just sold. Uh, and the, the laws in, in England, at least, um, don't always protect those objects. And it tends to be things that people drop. So it can be things like jewellery, for example, especially. Uh, coins, just things that people don't deliberately leave behind. The, the graves, the, the bodies are all from graves. But but this is this is different. Um, and uh, But recently there's been a new database in England that logs them and puts them all together. So we, as researchers, can, can actually... Um, look for patterns but unfortunately not all detectorists log their finds so that means that they're gone forever and uh, the work I've been doing is looking at the great army in England and how that moved about and until recently we knew very very little about it until we realised that these metal detected finds, little things that aren't in themselves important, so there can be things like coins, for example, little metal gaming pieces, they're all over the country. But if you look at the distribution of them, you can find patterns. And so you can actually trace this great big army from the 860s across the English landscape. And, and that's a big part of the book as well, um, that part of what I've been, been looking at. So it's really important for anyone who's metal detecting to log what they find and where they find it. Absolutely. And then if they want to sell it or keep it or whatever, that's that's fine. At least we know what, <laughs> what and where. So that's another thing that really fascinated me was when you talk about sort of people dropping coins or gaming. It was that the Vikings were great gamers. Yeah, they seem to have been because we find these gaming pieces uh, a lot, actually, in, in the thousands. And how do you describe them? What do they look like, the gaming pieces? So they, they vary quite a lot. The ones that I look at for the Great Army are actually just horrible, ugly little pieces of lead, which is why they weren't really seen as important. They are just, uh, they're kind of only about a centimetre or so tall. Uh, they're Quite often they're hollow underneath. They might have little sort of protrusions at the top, but they don't look like anything of value at all. But they range to, to some really quite extraordinary examples. They're made of bones sometimes that are carved beautifully, glass, some very, very pretty glass objects. So, so clearly... In some cases, they're very utilitarian, just like a sort of deck of cards that you'd have um, you know, to play if you're traveling. To, to sort of more high status, you can imagine a very ornate chess set or something like that. There's, there's those pieces as well. So it's, a, it's quite a wide range and they were clearly very popular. And so looking at all the techniques at your disposal and you've got this, this DNA, the forensics, the isotope analysis, and you've got eyewitness, not, obviously not many, but a few eyewitness accounts, you and I just wondered how you log these in order of importance and where the the items such as grave goods and drop jewelry would come in order of importance to tell you give you information. That's a very good question, and and there isn't really an easy answer to that. I don't think it depends a bit what question you are asking and what you're trying to find out. Unfortunately, a lot of the time we just don't have enough, and so you just have to take anything you possibly can uh, and so which is why something like logging all these artifacts suddenly adds hugely to to the system it, it, they tell you different things as well so the the bioarchaeology so the, the, the evidence from the human remains it, it's quite direct about those human lives whereas things like grave goods so things that people are buried with they kind of tell you something slightly different because they tell you what's the people who buried that individual, because you know, we don't bury ourselves, somebody, our, hopefully our loved ones do it for us. And it's, it's really their messages. So whatever you're buried with, any object you take with you in your grave, somebody else has chosen that. And they've chosen that for a reason. And they might be trying to send a, a particular message with that. They might be thinking about what you might need in the afterlife if you think that you're, you're going somewhere else. Or it might be something, you know, a message to people who attend your funeral to say, you know, look, we've got all this, this beautiful jewellery and we, we can afford to leave it in the grave you don't have to keep hold of it we can put it in so that's, sometimes you have to think of the messages as well so so it tells you an awful lot I mean I think for getting close to the people the individuals that sort of forensic stuff is really key to me but but then if you're looking at big trade networks and contacts then it's objects like the carnelian bead like the the silver coins and things like that so yeah it depends on the question I think uh, and what drove you to the vikings to specialize in the vikings was it your background and upbringing it was definitely a big part of that. 
But uh, I mean, when I grew up, I did, as I said, I, I went to that museum and I, I love that. But I was much more interested really in more exotic places. So places like ancient Egypt, for example. And a lot of my undergraduate excavations were far abroad, places like Zambia um, and other parts of Europe as well. So the Vikings just seemed a bit sort of a bit dull, really. That was that was what I'd grown up with at home. I just I would just travel and go places. But um, but when I realised that that story, the stories that I'd been told as a child and learnt at school about the Vikings actually weren't all that we knew and, and in fact there's an awful lot of unanswered questions and that these new methods could begin to to answer those that's when I got really back into the Vikings really I, I realized that I could contribute with something and at that point I'd already moved from Norway uh, to England and uh, so one of the big questions I was interested in was was women and migration among women in the Viking age and, and thinking of, of my own experiences as being a migrant woman and how what could we actually say? Because the, the the big story was that women stayed at home. They took no part in the Viking Age. It was it was a very male affair. They were all just raiding and pillaging, and women sat nicely at home on their farms. But when I started digging into the evidence for that, it really wasn't there. It was just assumptions, really. So so it was those things. I think being able to use new methods and and try and sort of answer some of those questions that we couldn't answer that's that's when it I realized actually the Vikings are, are far more interesting than we thought and what did you find about these women what were that what were their roles in if you know when you were researching the ninth century site of the great heathen army and you found this mass grave there was quite a high percentage of women in it and what were their roles so this is this is one of the things I've, I've been looking at quite a lot because uh, in this massacre there was about 20 20 percent were women which is quite a lot if you think of it as being a sort of marauding army and uh, we're back in the 70s and 80s when the site was first worked on it was thought that these women must be the local anglo-saxon wives that these these you know big viking men had had found when they came over to England and there was no assumption that or no sort of understanding that they could in fact have migrated as well but my looking at the evidence from their teeth showed me that the women had also moved about. So I can't quite conclusively say where they came from, but just like the men, they'd all, they weren't local. So they certainly weren't local Anglo-Saxon wives. And the same was the case from when I went down to that basement in Oslo and looked at those skeletons there, the Viking skeletons in Norway. There was also so many women who were moving about. So they definitely were not just sitting passively at home. They were big part of the movement out. We know from other places that they were involved in trading. There's lots of women buried with weights and scales, so they were actual sort of merchant traders. And there are some, uh, very small number, there are some female burials with weapons as well that suggest that they may well have had active uh, roles in warfare as well. So, but very diverse, and it was very possible for women to be in positions of power. So, the, the biggest that Viking ship I saw as a child, the Oseberg ship, was actually, which is the most spectacular uh, ship uh, ever discovered, really. That was the grave of two women. So, the richest and you know finest Viking grave is is a woman's grave, uh, and I think that says a lot that that women were very actively involved in Viking society and they had quite powerful roles, really. I, I sensed your irritation in the book when some previous archaeologists had ascribed that women found with Durit must have been gifts from her husband. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So there's this, this is recurrent. I mean, you see it so many times. There's, there's this, um, this very well-known fact that the Viking Age graves, uh, especially from the western coast of Norway, um, so many women's graves have objects, artefacts from uh, from Britain and Ireland in them. And uh, never do any of them say this could suggest that this is a woman from Britain who has arrived back from, you know, anything like that. It's always as a gift from a husband or a, a son or a brother. And that's that's every single time. Just because that is the assumption. The assumption was women stayed at home, men went out. Um, no other mechanism at all was, was, was suggested for that. Uh, but there was no evidence for it. it there was literally just the, the sort of 20th century explanation. And yeah, that did, that did irritate me <laughs> quite a lot. And I think you refer to the different ways that men and women might use carnelian beads, that the women were using it decoratively and the men had it around their waist as as you said for currency for trading it seems like it yeah i mean it's difficult to tell because we don't have that many but i mean it seems to certainly be that in female graves they are worn as jewelry and if we find them in male graves they're usually in a pouch or something like that um so they don't seem to be worn 
um, like that. But, you know, different types of jewellery, um, that's not the case for. So things like Thor's hammer necklaces, pendants that are, are very common. They're very often seen uh, with women, but also sometimes men. So there's clearly, there's jewellery and necklaces and things like that. Men are fine with beads as well, so it's possible. But carnelian does seem to be, be used that way by, by women. And Thor was the Norse god. Yes, yeah. So one of the Norse gods and uh, very much a, a sort of god of a warfare and god of thunder. And so uh, what we would quite often see as quite a masculine god, uh, really. But so it's interesting that a lot of these Thor's hammers are found with women. So he was worn to as a sort of protective presence to take when the army was moving to another territory. Quite possibly. I mean, there was definitely, it was a very dangerous way of life. And certainly for the people in this army, there's your battles every every <laughs> few weeks, probably. Um, it would be quite risky. So you can imagine, we don't quite know that much about the religion, um, actually. But it does seem that these must have had some sense of, of that sort of protection. Um, for the sort of the sort of powers that you would need to be on your side. So now I want to go back to the carnelian bead and the first time you saw it when you're digging in this mass grave, you come across this seemingly unremarkable trinket, a semi-precious gemstone bead. And and I think you say in the book that it had been found about 40 years earlier and just been ignored in a little Tupperware box. What was it about the bead that struck you as so significant when you first saw it? I, I was quite surprised to find it. Uh, it's very beautiful. It's very small. It's very beautiful. Uh, it looks brand new. I mean, you can you can buy these now in a market somewhere. And, and there's nothing really by looking at it to, to tell me that it, it came from the ninth century. So that was, I guess, one of the first things. But also knowing that carnelian uh, is not a material that you can find in Britain at all. You know, it's not a stone, so it must be imported. So I started looking into that and looking into where it would have come from. And it possibly around the Caspian Sea region as a possibility, but almost certainly uh, India as the most likely source of it. And that, I think, with just both, you know, part of the, the fact that I, I really like the bead in itself as a, as a beautiful object. But then that link, that sort of really powerful uh, knowledge that in the ninth century, that bead managed to make it all the way from Gujarat and to deepest, darkest Derbyshire um, is just uh, such an interesting uh, idea. So I got very obsessed with thinking about that and thinking, um, who who did it belong to for, for one thing, but also how did it happen? Uh, why could it do that? You know, why were those networks open uh, at that point in time? We tend to think that. Well, I think it's quite easy to think that back in the past, going back more than a thousand years, people must have lived quite locally and not had these big global connections. But I think that bee just just told me something very different and said, look, here's there's a mechanism here for a bead like that to get so far from the east to the west. Why is that? And, and so I just, it felt like a, a mystery I wanted to solve. <laughs> and you described this army, they come over, you said they weren't really quick raiding parties, as sometimes we have all been led to believe. They came and they literally entrenched and they'd stay for the whole winter season. You described them really as being quite early trendsetters that um, the local people wanted to emulate them. Yeah, so we certainly see this um, because, and not just that army, I should say as well, because you, you start to get settlers around about that time as well. So Scandinavian people start to settle. We don't quite know when and how. That's one of those big questions. But very quickly with that Scandinavian presence, especially in the east of England, you you start to see objects and it's particularly things like jewellery um, that, that are being copied so you get locally made examples you, we know that a lot of things are brought over because we can see that they come from the same workshops but we also see that things are being copied they are being used are these brooches in particular yes especially brooches yeah so female female dress jewelry and brooches that are very very popular and some of them clearly seem to be adapted to uh, what we would describe as anglo-saxon dress because of the sort of what we know about dress is not quite the same in Scandinavia. And they clearly have slightly different fashions. But then when the brooches come in, they, they sort of change the fittings and things so that they would fit better on the type of dress that's more popular in England. Or you might have a sort of local local um, silversmith just putting a different fitting on the back, repairing things. So, so those jewels there, I think, just really actually tell us something about that sort of cultural contact as well, that we're not talking about people who just see enemies coming in. They are really intermingling and the cultures are intermingling and, and things like jewellery and dress tell us a lot about that. And so brooches were very popular to fasten fabrics together. Necklaces, 
What else were they wearing that was quite decorative? Yeah, there's a lot of bracelets as well. Bracelets are very, very common. Um, but we do know that this this is used not just as jewellery. I talk about this quite a bit in the book as well, that actually the value is often in the metal as well that is in um, these objects. Uh, we know that men had uh, bracelets, a lot of bracelets as well, and they could be used as payment. And the silver was used as payment in those bracelets. So you could actually just cut pieces off and use that to pay um, and or you know have it remelted and reused so so some of it is clearly uh, a sort of decorative and, and fashion statement but some of it is also very functional practical yeah. which I guess is how people live now in a global world the first thing they pack up if they're in times of trouble is their jewelry and they take it to another place and so many emigres live on live on their jewels. But I loved there was a particular quote from the clergyman Alcuin of York to Ethelred, the king of Northumbria, talking about this sort of cross fertilization of, of their style. And he says, consider the dress, the way of wearing hair, the luxurious habits of the prince and the people. Look at your trimming of beard and hair in which you've wished to resemble the pagans. Are you not menaced by terror of them whose fashion you wish to follow? Yes. I think that's really amazing that they were terrifying and they were killing and pillaging, but people still wanted to emulate them. Yeah, but I think what that's also telling us is that that story, that sort of image we have of the Vikings as just being these raiders and, and you know, very dangerous pillagers, that is probably not quite true. And you probably have this other element of people trading a lot of peaceful settlement and contact and you know so that that is a, a big part of the viking age as well is that trade and, and that i think is is probably where you get a lot of people going well actually these people are quite nice and <laughs> they've got very very good hair and nice hairstyles you know so, so you get all of those things which 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 happens if when people are in contact with other cultures and you, you pick up all those influences so i think that shows a bit of a different story i think to the vikings than what we've been taught at school so they were assimilating into into the local environment and the local people. Yeah, absolutely. And um, when you talk about the the form of, of wealth carried in jewellery, you also say it's really important that they wanted to show what you describe as the chic of the exotic, that if they had something from far away, it showed they had some sort of connection and um, they were sort of luxury items weren't they? Yeah they really were and you see that happening um, in the Viking it's something that doesn't really happen quite so much before the Viking age but it becomes a very very big thing um, and if you look at Scandinavia especially a lot of these objects especially from the east so it can be things just like uh, the dirham coins so these Islamic coins that are being traded in vast quantities a lot of them just for the silver content and they're being melted down but they're being worn as jewellery as well so they get pierced uh, and hung as pendants from necklaces or made into brooches and you know they are quite pretty but but you know there's they are telling a very important message you get artifacts also that are made to look like islamic coins so they're not even real um but they are fakes and quite a lot of other objects as well that again fake and they, they sort of emulate these eastern objects and i think Things like the carnelian bead as well. Everyone knows you can't get a carnelian in Scandinavia. It, it sort of comes in. So you have a few of these beads in the in the years before the ninth century, and then all of a sudden there's just tons of them everywhere. They become the big fashion, and I think a lot of this is it, sometimes it is because they like the objects, but a lot of the times it's clear that it's you're showing off something. You're showing off that connection. Sometimes maybe it is an actual souvenir like you could imagine having you know those stickers that people put on their suitcases or places you know those old-fashioned how many places i've been passport yeah, stamps exactly that sort of thing it sometimes it feels a little bit like that maybe it is actual people who have traveled um or maybe it's that they've got a connection maybe that they can afford it um one of those things i don't know but it's it's really clear that that exotic that foreign that thing that isn't just normal scandinavian become something in itself, something very valuable. So it was a sort of bullion economy. This was also why they wanted to travel, was to get this silver so they could trade. Yeah, absolutely. So the silver becomes very, very important as a currency. And there aren't really any good silver mines, well, none in Scandinavia. Um, and the ones in Europe are quite small. Uh, bigger silver mines are not discovered until towards the end of the Viking Age. But in the Middle East, uh, they have a vast, an absolutely vast supply of silver. 
And with these trading routes opening up, that silver can get funneled north very easily. So the the trade, so things go down, um, things like uh, furs and ambers and, and sort of the more sinister part being the slave trade, which is very, uh, the Vikings are very successful in. That will go south and then the, the silver goes north. And silver is so good, it's, it's such good quality and it is very desirable. It's being used for, for you know, all this jewellery and it's very easy to melt down. It's easy to to, to weigh and to, to know how uh, pure it is. So it's a, it's a really, in that sense, it's a very kind of, it's a very practical thing. Um, you don't have a, a monetary economy in that same way until the end of the Viking Age. You don't really get coins that are used in the way that we use coins. But instead, you've got the, the silver. And in a way, it makes a lot of sense because you can go vast distances. You can trade in Russia, you can trade in Scandinavia, you can trade in England. And the weight of silver is always going to be the same. You don't have to worry about whether that coin is, is, is accepted. Um, so a bit like the euro, but much more. <laughs> much more. Yes. <laughs> Arriving in a strange country and you, you're stuck. You don't know what the currency is. Exactly. And you say that some of the silver found has little nicks in, so you can tell people have been testing the quality. Yes. So that was, uh, that was a very common. So we see that a lot, these very sharp nicks. That's how you test the quality. Because there was a lot of fraud, like with making those those fake imitation uh, bits of jewellery, there was also a lot of fraud going on trying to um, to get more than than you really should for, for your for your silver. So we do see a lot of that, which is clearly why they are testing it. So it was ever thus in the jewellery trade that there is fraud and counterfeiting. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thousands of years of it. Obviously, we, we need to talk about how they actually got there, because this is another sort of important part of the book, isn't it? That it's obviously their seafaring abilities. And I just wonder briefly if you could just tell us why they were so good at seafaring and what was special about their boats. Yeah, so the, the Viking ship really... Um is is a key part of the Viking expansion and it's not really the cause of it. Some people have said, well, is that why it happened? Because they had these ships. But I think it's more that it's a, it's a mechanism. It's what made it possible, I suppose. So the Viking ship develops in a very sort of specific shape that means that it's, it's very um, secure across uh, deep waters. You can go these vast distances across to Iceland or even North America. But you can also, they're very shallow. Um, so they're very well suited to going up on beaches and going down coastlines, uh, all sorts of different waters. They also developed the use of the sail, which was used in other parts of the world before, but not really in Scandinavia. And uh, the use of the keel. And all of that put together makes the ships extremely stable, very fast. Um, and you can you can literally go across the North Sea and you can land on a beach with no problem at all. And you can, all your men, you can fit horses on them, you can fit cattle on them. They are that big and that stable. And that makes it very easy and very practical. And really, it was something that hadn't been seen before. And you said that um, it would take them great lengths of time to prepare, wouldn't it? Because um, you, you, you quote how much wool they need to create these sails and how long it will take. It takes them years of preparation. Absolutely. I mean, the resources are really vast, uh, but it's it's clearly very well set up for that. Obviously, Scandinavia has a lot of wood and uh, they're very good. They've got very long traditions of woodworking Boats in Scandinavia have always uh, been an absolutely vital part of society because if you look at Norway and trying to get from one part of Norway to another, the, the only really sensible route is to go along the coastline and go along the fjords. So so there's these really old traditions of that. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's good quite good land for sheep so you can get the wool and that all sort of gets put together with those resources but but yeah I mean it wasn't the wealth was needed uh, to be able to afford those things and so that's why obviously raids make a lot of sense so that you can afford to build a boat and pay people to to, to man your boat um, there, there's a lot of money involved there that we don't necessarily think of and who's on board you've got the Vikings you've got some women you've got craftspeople You've got people to tend to the animals. You must have all those people, really. Um, and we know that children come along, to some of them as well. It will vary a bit. So a raiding mission will certainly be very different from a, a trading or settlement uh, mission. But I think you do get a lot of that. But you also get uh, use of a lot of locals uh, when you arrive. So they're not going to be completely self-contained unless they go to somewhere new like uh, the exploration of Greenland, for example, or North America being explored. 
then you definitely have to bring everyone yourself. But I think if we're talking about Europe, so going across um, to England or down the Eastern Rivers, for example, you are getting um, a lot of what you need in the places you go to. So we see these little settlements, these what what later turn into town, um, essentially springing up where the boats come in. And so it's actually clearly quite a, a sort of beneficial thing for the local communities as well, because they can actually make quite a lot of money. Because when this ship comes and they need to repair it, they need iron for new nails or they need a new sail or whatever, they're going to need that locally. And they're not going to, to sort of be able to just raid and steal everything they're going to have to buy quite a lot as well so provisions all of that so so actually some of these towns that spring up and start in the viking age they really are there as a response to those needs they're the sort of marinas and the harbors and little towns that that essentially are are just in response to what's needed and as you say the sort of shallow part of the boats enables them to use the network of rivers almost like um a road a road to other lands so this is an important part of the carnelian bead story isn't it absolutely yes because that's really what links scandinavia to these eastern routes and to the silk road it's those river networks that go across modern day russia and ukraine and belarus you have the ability to do that with the boats not necessarily the same largest ships but certainly smaller boats Another thing is that you can, uh, so they're easy to pull up on a beach, but actually you can pull them over land as well. So you can, if there's a rapid or, or a waterfall, something like that in the river, you can you can actually uh, pull them just along. You can even take them apart partially and then put them back together again. So, so that's a really, really key element. And it was the fact that they were sort of moving further and further in, making this possible, that opened up the network, so that made that silver um, made it possible for that silver to come back north again as well. So you describe it like flat pack furniture. They can sort of take it apart <laughs> and carry it across. It is a bit like that, I think. It's very, very practical <laughs> for Scandinavians. <laughs> so in a way, they were they were very instrumental in opening up global trade. Yes, absolutely. But I mean, I think what they're doing is they are, they are tapping into a lot of networks that are already there. So they're not creating everything from starting point because there are people living in these places who already have networks and connections. But they are definitely creating that link between East and West and making it possible and making it sort of long lasting. So that really, I mean, it is very much an early form of globalization, which is something we're sort of very keen on talking about today. But actually, we've got globalization happening 1200 years ago, because it means that you can get goods coming in from all the way from India and China, um, and very rapidly, really moving up to Scandinavia and to Western Europe. So Kat, they slightly hitched on to the silk route, the famous silk route that had been in existence for millennia, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. So that's already been there for you know several thousand years. And it's what's been d described as really the, the world's central nervous system. It's this vast spidery network of, of roads, not just one route from east to west, but actually a lot of them, which is why we often call it silk roads in plural. And that was really something that the Vikings could then tap into. So they could essentially make a sort of connection uh, just from, from the north, going down those eastern river routes and tapping into the networks that had already been established very, very long time beforehand. And it's interesting, something that I wasn't really aware of, that the Silk Route um, started because of the Chinese Empire who were creating relationships with nomadic tribes. And in um, as gifts to the emperor to keep peace, they gave silks. And of course, this luxury item, then people wanted to start trading, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's really the origin of it all. Uh, and then it just grows, uh, but it retains this name because that silk really was one of the most important commodities coming from the East, joined by lots of other things later on, of course, as well. But um, but yeah, that's that's the starting point. And then, of course, there's the darker side. And we've talked about a lot of these positive parts of the Vikings. Should we dwell for a moment on, on the dark side? Yeah, I think we do need to, um, actually. <laughs> so there's a few things. And one of them, which I mentioned briefly earlier, was the slave trade is a huge part of this. Uh, and it's really the slave trade was essentially one of the main reasons why they could get all of the silver going back in return. That may well have come all the way from, from northwestern uh, Europe, but it's more uh, likely that most of them come from those eastern territories. So, so the Slavic people especially, and in fact the, the very name slave 
comes from the Slavs, so the Slavic people in what is now Russia and, and those those parts especially. And it becomes from that Viking Age slave trade. And that, I think, gives you a sense of just how um, immensely large scale an operation we're talking about uh, here. And um, and that was really feeding uh, a need in the Middle East, especially um, also in places like Constantinople or, or Istanbul, as we know it today, where slaves were very uh, just a, a huge big part of of society. It wasn't unusual, but there were there were a lot of rules in different places about who you were allowed to capture and who you're allowed to sell. Um, so to, to for people to come from the outside uh, was very beneficial. So um, so that is one one certainly one big part of it. And you describe um, a funeral and burial um, episode, which has some quite unusual aspects to it. Which other people have to die at the burial, and there's a kind of orgy scene that takes place. Yeah, there's a very very extensively described uh, funeral. So it's an uh, an Arabic traveller called Ibn Fadlan who observes a, a, a burial by these people called the Rus, who, who we think are these Eastern Vikings. Uh, and he explains that uh, somebody needs to go with the chieftain who's died. So um, so the slaves are asked who's going to go with him. And the slave girl uh, volunteers and she says, I will go. And at that point, she then is essentially going to become his wife uh, in death. Is that an honour? Is that seen to be an honour? It is, yeah. In some weird way. Yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> and actually, it's been a lot of interesting discussion about that because a lot of focus previously has been on, you know, the fact that there's this girl. I mean, so she she then has to go through this ritual of having sex with about six or seven different men, all the, the chieftain's men, um, who say, well, I'm only doing this for you and um, and all of this. And then eventually she, she does get murdered and, and put in the grave. She then gets to say things like, well, I can see paradise, I can see my master waiting for me, I can see my mother and my father. And she's elevated. So she's clearly someone stuck as, as a slave girl. But she's given this choice. She's treated, she's given jewellery, she's given bracelets um, and things as a part of that ritual. And then she becomes the chieftain's wife. So so she essentially has a, has a way out um, of her life, which involves her going into the afterlife, which I think if you very strongly believe that that is just the next phase, then perhaps that isn't quite so bad but it's um it's a really interesting insight that account into to what this really meant in that society were there other accounts at the time as well of these these um burial situations not of burials we have very few i mean there are a few others that also talk about they're a little bit more dubious so they don't they're not eyewitness accounts in the same way but there are some others that also suggest that um in some cases women might be sacrificed to to follow uh, their men uh, into death it's a little bit unclear how common that is or how real uh, those cases are. But we certainly do know that the, the, the slaves were a part of, of that society in all sorts of different ways. So then um, in your book, you find a matching Carnelian bee in the Ukraine. And so that must have been a really exciting moment. Yeah, it really was. So at this point, I had started writing the book. I was about halfway through. got this opportunity to go and lead excavations in Ukraine um, of, of one of these trading sites along the river. And I, I jokingly said to my colleagues there who'd already been working at the site for 10 years, I said, look, here's a picture of what I'm looking for. And they said, well, they've had them elsewhere in Ukraine, but never here. In 10 years, we've never found one. And then a few days later, uh, one of the, the supervisors came down and said, uh, Dr. Kit, I have something for you. <laughs> and he held out his hand and, and it was a bead that matched absolutely perfectly the one found in Repton, completely the same. And yeah, that was probably career-wise one of my absolute favourite moments uh, because I'd been writing about it and I've been trying to think of these links and thinking, you know, this is what I think happened, this is where I think it went, and and that's one of the reasons I was there. And um, and yeah, there it was. And there it was. So then you were more determined that the trail you were on across the Baltic down the Volga to Turkey was really the right trail. Yeah, yeah. It felt like you know if if this could if the bead could have sort of been there a thousand years ago then then it must be <laughs> it must be right and so you go to constantinople and you find quite a lot of evidence of viking presence through graffiti yes so this is also one of my favorite uh, bits of evidence actually really so in the hagia sophia uh, which was was there in the ninth century there is uh, quite a lot of graffiti and it includes several runic inscriptions that we know were only really used by the Vikings, by the Scandinavians. They've got names. Um, one of them 
practically or basically says something like Halfdan was here. And uh, there's a few other names inscribed as well. And then more recently, uh, a new one was found of what is very clearly a Viking ship. It's perfectly, it's got just the right shape. It's got shields on the side and the sail. And um, these, again, it bring it back to what we were talking about uh, at the beginning, the sort of human element to it. This isn't just about sort of battles and war and raids and, and, and all of that. This is, this is somebody who's standing in that church and is probably quite bored and wants to leave a mark for eternity and um and that's what they've done and they'd only leave a mark of something that they've visually seen and experienced absolutely yes and you know and the writing because there's a runic writing system that is not something that you would have in Constantinople at the time that's that's going to be it's going to be written by somebody who has that link to Scandinavia and so then the last port of call in your story is Gujarat how did that feel getting to Gujarat and I love this, how you how you voiced it in the book. You, you know you've got to where the carnelian bead came from, was cut, was mined. And you said, it's impossible not to feel moved by the thousands of years of history in these hills and plains to consider the remarkable distances that those minerals have travelled. So what did it feel like to get there? It was a very sort of spine-tingling uh, moment, actually, and it still is when I think about it today. It was the fact, I mean, so, so this really did come at the end. I'd written the whole book. I actually thought I wasn't going to be able to go for various reasons, and then an opportunity came up. So it was a very last-minute thing, and I sort of finally got to go there. And... Um, Again, trying to, to find these mines, track them down, was actually really difficult. But again, so just stroke of luck, found somebody who could show me uh, and get to really what I think is is the, the place that the, the carnelian came from. And they're still mining carnelian now yep. or was it depleted? No, no, still doing it now. So, And it's very, it was very interesting to see that because I, in my mind, always thought, you know, big mines, a big industrial activity type thing. But it really wasn't. It was extremely small scale. There was, there was a woman living in a, in a very small house out in the middle of nowhere and she would go out and pick what really were just pebbles off the surface so most of it is not even dug into the ground it's just picked off the surface there's a few a few places where um where it sort of naturally comes out of the ground that's a little bit more what you might think of as a mine but really they're not they're just stones that i mean picked up and i was taken around by this bead maker who is a sixth generation bead maker his his father and father's father again um had had worked on this material on carnelian and he could just spot it a mile away so we we're driving this jeep and and he would just jump out and go oh and he'd seen one and he'd just stop and so he said wave me out of the car and, and pick up a, a huge big piece of of raw carnelian and that i think it just made it think well well actually this what feels like such a big story is just the story of lots of individual lives lots of individual smaller events smaller smaller sort of links in a chain that that made up that huge network and um and i think coming there and seeing that was yeah I mean, indescribable really and the bead maker you watched him polish some beads and you described that, that he used the same ancient techniques that would have been used yeah absolutely so they're, they're being cut um some of it is just being being napped or being literally just having other stones to, to, to break it apart into smaller pieces and then just filing down um, sanding down the drilling was really really interesting so you've got this um, the small drill just a just a stick really with a, with a sort of leather thong um, and a bow that's being just rubbed really quickly and it's got diamond at tip on the stick to to actually make the hole from from either side of the bead. Um, I did get to try and I was absolutely not <laughs> very good at it. It was quite tricky. But, you know, the people who've done this for generations know exactly how to do it. Everything was set up. It was, it was a particular position you had to sit in so that you could hold it. There was water from a special pot to keep it cool. It was a very, very simple, very straightforward, but it was clear. It was that skill and, and the sort of generations of knowledge uh, that had just clearly just been passed on. And in fact, his his 17-year-old um, son was there and he was being trained. So that was going to be the next generation so you can you can sort of see you can imagine how that would have stretched back mm. it's very much still a family business in india as you say and you get particular families who are good at carnelian and particular families who are good at ruby yes. and it is that sort of as you say that accumulation of years of knowledge that sort of is is passed down to make them experts in their particular gemstone absolutely but when you talked about all the people in the process of this story and this sort of, not just the network of rivers, but as you say, the network of humans who cre who created it and enabled it. And I thought that was something that really struck me as a modern tale, even though you were talking about the Vikings, because it showed how 
the globalization, people moving about as they move now, migrants moving between borders, the sort of melting pots of groups between the different, the East and the West, the importance, I imagine, to have spoken different languages and to learn different languages. And I thought that was a very modern story. I think that was one of the things I wanted to get across, actually, that that really, I don't think we are that different. We tend to think of, of the past as being a completely uh, different place where people did and behaved and acted so differently. But actually, I don't think they did. And I think they, they lived and, and loved and did all the things that we do. And, you know, people would move. And, and I think that goes back to when I was thinking about migration and, and what it was like for me to be a migrant woman uh, raising my own children as bilingual, you know, half Scandinavian, half English. How many generations does it take be before they lose the language? How much, you know, how quickly do you get integrated? All these questions that are very relevant to us today. You know, what does it mean? Do you show off that you can travel and that you've been places? You know, people who go on a gap year. I, I, I often think of uh, these young men, especially who go on the Viking raids as, as sort of going on, on a, a gap year type, <laughs> type uh, activity because that, that's... Quite extreme gap year. <laughs> yeah, quite an extreme gap year, but it's what you did. And we do know that from the records, you know, that was very popular for young men to, to do that before they settled down. They would go out for a bit and then come back again or, you know, maybe joining the army so you get to see the world. It's the same thing. So, you know, we are ultimately at the end of the day, we're all people, we're all humans. We just happen to be born in a different time or in a different place. But... But those characteristics, those things that we need and those things that we create around us, I think have been the same for uh, thousands of years, really. And I think that's one of the things I wanted to get across in the book, that archaeology and history isn't just something sort of very dusty and boring. It's, it's relevant to, to our current lives. For sure. And especially when you describe what happens when all these different people mix, they carry contagion. Yes. And we've... <laughs> this is something we know about. Absolutely. So this is something that... <laughs> Interestingly, as I was just revising the book, I'd actually written it already. And um, uh, during the one of the first lockdowns, um, I I was revising and editing. And um, this new article came out about the spread of smallpox. And it turns out that the first smallpox was spread to England and to northwestern Europe by the Vikings. And that was a consequence of this globalization really and it was the fact that they could be moving it most likely came from the from the middle east possibly from from in the further east um but it was that fact that they could move and they did it so rapidly they brought things like first and things that could carry the contagion as well and you know i was writing this whilst we were just thinking am i allowed to travel we can't fly we have to close the borders and it was just it was the same tale it was it was remarkable um and that really demonstrates i think that the link between the past and the present and i have to ask you did you buy any carnelian beads in India? I did buy a few, yes. Um, but I also was given some of the raw material. So on my to-do list one day when I've decided what to do, I would love to take some of that material and actually create something myself and have something to remind me of this whole thing. Um, so I've got these these quite big lumps of carnelian um, sitting at home that one day I want to make my own, uh, or get, well, get someone to make <laughs> jewellery for me to sort of represent that. In a Viking style? Quite possibly, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of pondering that. I do very much like uh, replica jewellery. That that means something. So I've got several several things that that replicate various um, a necklace from Gotland. And actually, when I when I wrote my PhD, I had a copy of the Thor's silver Thor's hammer that was placed around the warrior's neck in 873 when he died. Um, and I wore that as a sort of connection. I think as a reminder. And I, I quite like having having those links and having a sort of personal connection with jewellery. It certainly does that. In the same way as you touched the boat and you were instantly connected back, I feel jewellery has that same power. And when I've held things that were worn by Catherine the Great or you sort of realise you're having that same visual experience that somebody had so many years ago. Absolutely. Um, did it change your view of, of jewellery, writing this book and, and um, tracing this story? A little bit, yeah. I mean, definitely. So it's, I think it's the two elements, one of them being those connections and actually thinking about where does this come from and what sort of lives and what stories um, are involved in that, whether that's that's a, a gemstone or gold or, you know, whatever. What what are those links? Um, so definitely thinking about that. But also the kind of messages that we tell with the jewellery that we wear. And I think before this, I was more into sort of thinking, well, I, I like this for, for whatever reason. This is pretty. This is this is, means something to me. But actually being so much more aware of 
what's what signal is that actually giving out to other people because it's not just about you you are telling a story with that um even you know, it might be conscious or it might be unconscious uh, but i think looking at how how all of that how the silver especially was used as as wearable currency you know what are you showing off what are you telling um and all of those connections all of that so i think it made me think much more about what we what i would sort of be saying with my jewelry and what what other people are saying with theirs and it's interesting to think of how much of that is conscious. I don't know. I think a lot of it for people might be on subconscious. I think um, they might think they're just wearing things because they like it. But, um, but yeah, I think that that was probably what I took away from it the most. And that's a great thing about jewellery. And um, it's so interesting that, that, that you had that conclusion. So Kat, there's some pieces of Viking jewellery in the British Museum for anyone in London. But if they wanted to see a big, impressive collection, where should they go and have a look? I think to do that, you really do need to go to Scandinavia and to some of the museums there. Certainly in Denmark, the National Museum in Denmark has a, a lot of really beautiful um, uh, jewellery there. Also in, in Oslo, so the Museum of Cultural History, we, we are going to get a brand new Viking ship museum uh, in about five years time. So if people can wait, <laughs> then five years you'll be see all the, the most amazing treasures from, from Norway. Um, there's one collection in particular there, a, a hoard called the Hohen Hoard, um, which is a, a a spectacular collection of female jewellery. It's got beads, it's got brooches, it's got pendants from so many different locations. It's got a lot of gold unusually as well. Um, and it's, it, was, it was found one collection, it was clearly one family or one woman's personal collection of jewellery um, that showed, you know, several hundred years of history, objects that were uh, were many hundred years old as well. So that is one. I think if you're going to see one of them, go to Oslo uh, Museum of Cultural History to, to see that one. Thank you so much for sharing your own personal experience as well as this absolutely fascinating tale. Oh, my absolute pressure. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Thank you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes of If Jewels Could Talk, please go to our website, carolwalton.com slash podcasts. And if you liked it, please share it any way you can. Please subscribe to our podcast feed on any of the usual platforms where you find your podcasts. And please leave us a rating and a comment. Join me again in two weeks for the next Jeweled Nugget when I'm going to be joined by not just one, but two Vogue cover stars. They happen to be mother and daughter. I'm not going to tell you who they are. You're going to have to listen in. And they're going to talk about the culture of jewellery within their family and how they mark important moments and occasions by giving jewellery gifts. And with Mother's Day coming up, it's going to be very relevant. So please join me then. Goodbye. If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Walton is produced by Natasha Cowan, music and editing by Tim Thornton, graphics by Scott Bentley, illustration by Geordie Labanda, and you can find me on Instagram at Carol Walton. <laughs>